What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another exciting episode of Meet the. I'm your host, Troy Rawlings. And today, we got a brother who's, uh, what's, what's ironically, he's very unsung. He's 30 yeah. years in the game, <laughs> 30 plus years in the game, journalism, film, TV, uh, multi award winning, Emmy award winning, and NAACP Image Award winning um, director, producer, writer, his writing chops. Uh, used to get his homeboys, girls back in the day. Uh, that's true. That's real talk. <laughs> Give it up for the one and only P. Frank Williams. What's I'm in on? the building. What's up, my boy? Troy Yizzle. What's up, man? How you doing? Happy 2021, my guy. Happy. We, we made it. We made right. it. We here. <laughs> yeah. we, Donald Trump, yeah. I don't know how much longer he going to make it, though, in 2021. <laughs> I think there's a jail cell written with his name on it somewhere. Man. People don't look, we usually don't date these, but if you know anything about we're in a historic time coming out of 2020, going in, in 2021. Um, I like to give people their flowers while they're alive, especially okay. we just went through. So right. I gotta give you you props. And I met P on the most in the most um Hollywoodish time. The people who have help influence some of the things I do, whether they know it or not. Uh, Chris Williams, who was the director of How Do I Look for the Style Network. He was my okay. first guy, my first TV development deal here um, with the Taboo Talk piece. I met P sitting at a bar restaurant next to each other. Mm -hmm. That sounds like something I would be doing. <laughs> that sounds that right. <laughs> and we were just talking. Like, mm -hmm. he never saw what he did. He saw I was producing a, a music music night he gave he actually gave me a couple points I think and came out and supported. He never said who he was, what he did. He talked a little bit. I, he gave me his card. But um after that, we started talking. I saw what he was doing. I was like, man, I gotta get you on my show. Okay. And through the form, you're here. So here we go. Whoa. There it is. Yes. <laughs> I jump around a little bit, but let's go all the way back. Back. Back in time. Back, back in time. Back in time. Where are you originally from? Well, I'm originally from Oakland, California, home of the, you know, the Raiders, the A's, the Black Panthers, Revolutionary Brothers, Todd Shaw. You know what I mean? That's what we do. Yeah. Yes, yes. So you're from Oakland. Mm -hmm. And when did you realize, well, well, I, I've read a little bit of your bio, which was which had me cracking up when you talked about the um, the cats that were writing the letters. So right, you're in okay. When did you realize that was it poetry? Was it was it just the fact that you know how to put the words together? And and when did a brother realize that? Hey man, can you do something for me, P? <laughs> uh, well, you know it's interesting. I think that growing up in those urban environments like Oakland or Baltimore or, or D.C. or South Central in the seventies and eighties, you know, a lot of these young guys who were in the hood, some of them weren't as good in going to school. I was like that s smart ghetto kid, like around like you know whatever craziness going on, drugs, violence, or Wildlife in East Oakland, um, Funktown, USA is where I'm from, and Murder Doves. And so a lot of my homeboys who were selling dope or just not whatever, like girls in school. But they didn't have the capacity to write a love note or, you know what I mean? They have money. They could buy them something. But those girls really wanted whatever. And so they couldn't articulate that. And I was a kid. I had big glasses. I would write all day. And so they're like, hey. And I was, you know, I had a nickname back then. And they was like, yo, my man, why don't you write a letter for my girl? And I was like, yeah. I was like, what's her name? You know what I'm saying? Barbara, Denisha, Laquisha. Yeah, Laquisha, your eyes are like starry in the middle of the night. And, you know, every time I see you, my soul just sets on fire. And they, you know, I write it up, put their name on it, put a little sprinkle of accent, what they want. And, you know, that was the beginning of my journalism career. I had no idea that that was me starting to be a journalist, starting to tell stories, starting to interview people and figure it out. So, yes, the beginning of my whole career, I started out um, writing letters for D-boys and gangsters in my neighborhood in any so. <laughs> you got the you got the reputation like yo talk to Pete. Yeah, yeah. Talk to the kid with the big glasses so when, and the afro. When did you, when did you sprout? Because you look like an athlete. You're about you're about you're about six two, I'm six three. Six two, two forty. And so uh I played tight end. I played outside linebacker in high school, baseball. You know, I was an okay athlete. Um, but I obviously had a the brain situation work. So I'm definitely on the bigger, you know, side of the the black man scale, you know, scale where you know, sometimes in these Corporate environments, the white man be like, "Oh, okay, what's up, big brother?" You know, so, yeah, oh, that's what it is. <laughs> oh, this yeah. is the writer. <laughs> no, but yeah, that was the beginning of my journalism producing career in the hood, writing letters. 
So you go into, you start going into meetings, you start meeting people. Um, and like you said, you're the big guy walking in. So you got into journalism. You realized you had a love for writing. You're in high school, you're doing your thing, playing sports. Was it the academics or the sports that opened the college door for you? I think in, in high school, I was blessed because I wrote for the student newspaper. Um, and I also play sports. You know, you got those, I always say I was like, you know, not in a bragging way, but like a renaissance man. You know, I love sports and outgoing, athletic, you know, as best as I could. And But always with that pen. I always had that pen. And so I always think I should have probably been a rapper because I had some real good, you know, in, in high school, I wrote a sports column. Um, and then, you know, I was a junior statesman, you know, the student guy. You know, it was it was weird because there was a point in my life, though, where, you know, I was homeless. I think I've mentioned and I've talked about my story and been very clairvoyant that, you know, it wasn't always the greatest time. But the academics and being scholarly is what kept me alive. And so um, even if I slept in my car for you know months, almost a year, I still kept going to school. So, yes, it was the academics that helped me go to San Diego State and then the Columbia University. You know, what I mean, so, you know, stick with them books. And I always, you know, it's, it's a trip because I think a lot of the young hustlers don't realize. And uh, me and my buddy, I see always talk about it's a marathon. It's the long yeah. game. And so a lot of the young guys that I saw in my urban neighborhood who were selling dope or trying to get into stuff or whatever, that's the short run. And so I always was able and fortunate to see the long, the long, the marathon, not sprint. So. Let's 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 talk about that a little bit. You're going to college. And you find yourself in a situation where you're homeless. Yeah, well, right before I went to college, uh, when I was 16 years old, my mother was out, you know, doing stuff and wasn't really there um, in the household. I was taking care of them and I was out in the streets briefly. And, and then I was able to um, live with my grandmother. And so I was sleeping in my car for a while when I was in high school and uh, I kept going to school. And uh, when I turned, I was about to be 18. I packed up all my clothes um, and put them all in the U-Haul truck. And I drove myself to San Diego State. Um, no mom, no dad, nothing. And just was like, I got this, you know, some scholarships and Pell Grants, you know, what they was giving yeah. out back then. And I was like, I'm going to be on this college tip because I knew that at that particular point uh, in Oakland, there was a lot of crazy people from the Bay Area. Felix Mitchell, Lil D, uh, Mickey Mo. There was a lot of street stuff going on. And so I had family members who were affiliated with that. And so I knew that if I didn't get out of that, that was, you know, sometimes in life you have those things. If you go this way, end up that way. If you go that way, something else is going to happen. And I had a spidey sense that it was best to go this way. So, yeah, man, it was blessed. I went to undergrad at San Diego State, went to Columbia Journalism School, uh, worked at the L.A. Times. And, you know, I've been able to just kind of keep the journalism and writing thing for many years before I went to the source. So. So what was it about? What is it about writing that? That feels like nothing else you you can do because you're a man when you're a renaissance guy you got many talents but when you when you put that pen to paper pencil whatever and you start writing where does it take you well you know like i said it goes back to that kid with the glasses who would sit in his room and read all these books and you know i think as a child i remember watching happy days and laverne and shirley and uh what's happening and the jeffersons and no matter what was going on outside of me or in the hallway or in my own house that was my escape, my getaway. So it's learning how to tell stories about people. And, you know, I was really shy. It's crazy that I'm so outgoing now because I was a very shy kid. And uh, I started writing. And so I write my little stuff. And, you know, at some point, um, telling stories was always what it was about. And so I was blessed to be able to do that. And, uh, you know, I think I always tell my kids and people that I know, it's great that you had a, you have a gift. I had a gift to be able to write. It, it, right. I didn't make it up it just was I was born with it but I didn't just sit on it I actually did something with it and wrote and those poems became articles in high schools those articles became articles in LA Times those articles became Suge Knight Biggie Tupac you know Scarface Dr. Dre whatever all of that you know later on source how did you get introduced to the source the source magazine um well you know I um was a reporter at the LA Times when I graduated from Columbia University I started working at um, the LA Times. I got a job in this like diversity program. And while I was at Columbia, one time I was in the auditorium and it happened to be the 50th anniversary, 50th issue of the Source magazine. And so at my school at Columbia in 1994, um, I met Dave Mays, the owner mm. of the Source at Columbia in the auditorium. And also wow. there was Grandmaster Flash, uh, Africa Bombada, and who else is Grandmaster? And Kuhark, 
I met them all one day. Is Dave a part of the Zulu Nation? Because that's Zulu no, Nation. but it, was just, it just happened to be a 50th anniversary of Source and it had all those pioneers. Right, so I said, right. hey, Dave Mays, you know, what's up? I'm P. Frank. I bum rushed him. Like, I, I didn't have my demo tape, but I was like, yo, here's my little writing card. And so I was like, yo, Dave, I got to get down. The Source was the Bible of the, the culture. Yeah. And, you know, and I was a B-boy. I've been a B-boy since, you know, I could put my Pumas on in my cardboard box in, in you know, 81. And so, uh, yeah, I met Dave. I was like, hey, Dave, I'm the man. Give me some love. And so they didn't have anybody on the West Coast really writing about hip hop. So at the LA Times, I started writing about hip hop and I wrote about AMG. I'm celebrating currently my 25th anniversary in the culture in 1995. My first article about AMG came out in the source. So when I met Dave, probably about, about nine to 10 months later, I got my first article. And then after that, I did a few and they trusted me. And then I ended up covering Easy es funeral and the death of Eazy-E. So my first source cover was about Easy es death in 1995. I know that takes me back. Y'all like, y'all like what? Yes, 1995. It's some people. It's some people watching right now that they don't even know what the source is. Okay. Like, there's a generation that okay. doesn't know. Like, to have like the source was the Rolling Stone of hip hop in the 90s and early 2000s. Rolling Stone, you know, are the source covered hip hop as it was growing. So as the culture, Jay Z, Biggie, Tupac. Um, DMX, Rough Riders, all of that exploded. Hip hop exploded as the number one music. We were there in the same club. I always tell people, if Puff and Jay Z is right there partying in the club, that's me and my boys over here doing whatever else, trying to cover them, trying to document the culture. The source was the first place that the culture was unfiltered. You know what I mean? Right. It was raw. It was real. And it didn't look like it before XXL or anything like that. It didn't look like like you had Write On and these little magazines that look look. Romper roomish, no offense to them, but right. Source came and was like, like you said, they were there. Yeah, they were interviewing. And if you got five mics in a Source, uh. <laughs> let me tell you, it was there were hip hop. There are people we consider hip hop legends that never got five mics in a Source, and they, you know, Biggie said he wanted to get five mics. He got it before he passed away. Right, I think he got. I forgot and what. And Straight, by the way, um, crazy story. Uh, you mentioned the five mics, the most coveted, craziest thing. In the all of you know, at least in that time um, frame, yeah. I just was on this thing talking about Nas, and Nas was the first artist ever on his debut album to get debut. Fired. Dramatic, yeah. I I reviewed the Chronic, two thousand one, yeah, whatever is that, whatever year that's Dr. Dre came out with that, right? And so, at the time, the way that we did the five mics, I know I would tell people this, this is a, people don't know this, the way that the source did the five mics was we would take a copy or, or a CD of the album, and everybody in the whole office or the editors would listen to it, review it, write a little something, and then put how many mics they think it deserved. And so it would go all the way around, and then you would add that up, essentially. And so we went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth about the Chronic 2001. Mm. Ended up getting four and a half mics. I think because I'm a West Coast cat, and I, by the way, was the first West Coast editor of The Source. I opened the West Coast office of The Source on Sunset. Is that I think some of the New York dudes was hating. They just was haters. You know what I mean? They, they didn't want to give the West Coast that love. You're from Baltimore, right? I'm no, from I Baltimore. Y'all thought, East Coast, y'all thought that was, y'all was the bomb. And so, uh, ironically, we didn't give Dre four, five mics. We gave him four and a half. Later on that year, is that year, we did the Source Hip Hop Music Awards. And I went to Dr. Dre's house. And we taped the whole thing where I gave him a sort of a posthumous five mic award. And so Dre was supposed to come out that day and accept it on the Source Hip Hop Music Awards, but that became the year of the fight on stage and Snoop and Suge. And so just a little bit of hip hop history. Yes, you know, the, the mics, come on, boy. You know, you know, back in the day, the mics. I think that's why, that, and that little four and a half mics might have been the, the spark. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what you think? They was like, they was bad and you only oh, got four and a half. That was like, yo, was that the reason that, Y'all ain't got East Coast ain't got no love for death row. <laughs> Let it be known. Right, like, right, right. Hilarious. <laughs> it was people that I know that were in. The, were you there? You were there. You had to be in the audience. Were I you there? Wrote that show. Yes, I, I was on stage. I mean, I not to be like that, but I I remember being on stage at that. Is that two thousand and one? Because I did ninety nine, two thousand, two thousand one, and this was the year I think we were at the Pasadena, and then the death row dudes came from one side, and Snoop and his people were one other side. And they were fighting on stage and the police were there. They started to try to mace people and snoop and they started fighting on stage. And then there was a fight in the or anyway, wild days. But yes, 
the source, um, when the source movie documentary comes out, people are going to be like, oh my God. As, I mean, to be alive in, in the beginning and the starts of hip hop, people don't even understand what, what that means for us and why we, why we so serious about the culture as a whole. So you, you get your stamp, you know, now, now coming off of source, and doing the award, were there award shows for Source? Was that your first time? Well, what with- happened was I worked at the LA Times for six years, and throughout that time, I was freelancing for the Source. Okay. And then the Source wanted to open a West Coast office, and I opened that West Coast office as the first West Coast editor. And then I worked for a few years, and what happened was the Source Hip Hop Music Awards started again after a brief hiatus in '99. Is that right? All my Source people, and they was like, "Well, who's going to write it?" And I was like, well, I'm already here. <laughs> I'm a TV major. And boom, I ended up producing and writing the first source of 99 when we came back. And then 2000, 2001. And then that led to the Vibe Awards and the BET Awards and BET Honors. And I worked a little bit on the Grammys and uh, uh, many years on the NAACP Image Awards. And so, you know, that I always say that 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 source time introduced me to so people, so many people, Dr. Dre, Tupac, Biggie, whoever else but also industry people that I work with who I'm still cool with today. So that job helped me do a lot on music shows and television later. Now, how was the transition from writing to producing? How, how, did, how, did, you, um, how, how did that feel to you? How did you go from writing to producing? Meaning it goes from writing and seeing One second, people... one second. Nyla, can you close your door? Mm-hmm. Yeah, close the door. No, please, please. One second, thank you. Just gotta stay checking on them. Um, no, no, I'll take- I, I, I think I'll- the transition from Let me the whole thing is this, right? I think that the main thing is that if you can tell a story as a journalist, my got my job, whether at the source or LA Times, or whatever, is to have a beginning, middle, and end of a story. And so being able to produce, it's still about telling a story as a storyteller. People ask you, well, what do you do? I say I'm a storyteller. I'm a writer, a producer, but I actually just tell stories. And so I think that that transition was easier because I knew how to write. If I didn't know how to write, I don't think there's, I'm nowhere, anything that I've done has not been achieved without being knowing how to write. It's about that kid with the Afro. I'm gonna keep going back to the kid with the Afro, with the little, you know, uh, I had a little spiral notebooks back then. And I had the, you know, the black, the um, old school notebooks with the white, the black on the front with the little pages, oh, you know, spiral, yeah. like a little notebook thing. And so I used to write in that. So you go from that and you start producing. When does, when does directing come into play? When did you get a chance to well, actually it's direct? Because, you know, once I started producing um, some of these BET shows, I ended up working at BET. And mm-hmm. like, you know, not like fully on staff, but I had a desk there and I was there for many years and starting around 2005. And I started producing a show called American Gangster. I don't know if people know American Gangster. And, um, you know, when I go out to produce a show, somebody has to direct it. Somebody has to go out and direct the talent, the camera, do all of that. So it just sort of happened by necessity. You know, one thing people, I don't care what people say about BET, BET taught me so many different kinds of skills because I had to do everything, you know? And uh, director is the same thing as that kid writing in a notebook. I'm telling what the characters are, where people need to be, you know, giving people certain things to say or what looks great, a lighting and that kind of thing. So, um, right. It just it just happened. I didn't I didn't decide to. I just had to because I'm like, we don't have no money for a director, so I'm gonna do it myself. You know what I mean? You're looking around like, who's directing this? They're like, <laughs> uh, looks like it's me. You said you wanted to do it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and here we are. Yeah. No, it's, it's good, man. I think that, uh, um, you know, I, I saw where John Singleton. You know, I interviewed John in Lamert Park one time. Uh, rest in peace to John. His office used to be in Lamert Park, and uh, we were talking. And the reason why Boys in the Hood happened because nobody wanted to tell that story. And mm-hmm. he was like, I don't trust nobody else to direct this and tell this story of my life and whatever. And the studio took a risk. But you got to tell your own stories. And so for me, it's always been about that. And so directing happened because I didn't trust anybody else to tell my own vision. So come full circle a little bit because I want to um, spend a little time. And you have you have plenty. You definitely take a chance when you get a chance. Uh, you'll see the information below on the YouTube, IG, check out pfrankwilliams.com. Right. And it's a massive, it's a massive piece. We can't cover it in one hour. We got to do a uh, but, um, Dedication, hard work, dedication. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? So 
who created Unsung? Because well, Unsung right now, came about, um, it's a weird story because what happened was, I think I was working on American Gangster, yeah, and then the same company that was producing American Gangster, which was by Reggie Hudlin, um, shout out to Nelson, uh, those guys, and they started working on this company called A Smith, Arthur Smith Company, A Smith, which produces now American Ninja Warrior, Titan Games, all of that. I happened to be working for that company. And unsung, there were some executives from TV One who aren't um, there anymore, but they wanted to do a biography show about R&B and hip hop artists who never got their due and ended up contracting A. Smith, Arthur Smith, um, shout out to my man Frank Sinton and Mark Rowland, who were executives on Unsung, and they created the template. I think the first episode of Unsung was about the Clark sisters, if I'm not mistaken, or Donny Hathaway, one of those. And so and by the second season, since I was already working with them, I came on. And so Unsung was created by TV One executives and then ended up being produced by A. Smith and co. Amazing. So... You're, and what season, because it's hard to track a season because it seems like Unsung has never stopped. And it's just I think we're on season season. 12 now, by the way, I think is the number, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe and, and it's so much of a cultural thing now because I've talked to people. Um, I've interviewed Will Downing. I've interviewed Crystal Waters. I've interviewed um, uh, I'm friends with Stephen Russell from Troop. Um, I remember when his troop unsung came out, he started, he's texting everybody. Did you see the unsung? Did you see it? So uh, at first uh, it was like something you was like, oh man, this is so, oh, uh, this is hard. I watched that with my daughter and we, we watched it during Thanksgiving, especially this quarantine. During the quarantine, I've probably seen every unsung. We uh, uh, see Sunday dinners. <laughs> Yo, it is an impeccable show. Thank um, you. Thank it, you is, it is amazing because the only thing we had before that got close to that was seeing our artists on Soul Train or seeing our artists on award show. We never got a chance yeah, to hear one the of the reasons why Unsung um, won. I don't know if you're familiar with Behind the Music. Um, yes. I also yes. produced a show yes. called Beach One Hip Hop Honors and a couple other things, but there was a vacuum for black artists, hip hop, soul, R&B, who would never get on Behind the Music. And so right. there was a whole host of amazing, beautiful black artists who wouldn't get that chance. So Unsung created a place where those artists you love, whether it be Full Force, you know, Houdini, rest in peace to my man, X, um, whoever else, got a chance to get their stories told. And I think that that's why it became so successful, because those artists would never get that time on a traditional VH1 or something like that. That's one of the things that uh, that was so impressive about and um, uh, so magnetic about having unsung because like you said vh1 had behind the music but unless you're pop rock or ultra star we're not getting the vibe off of our art we don't we're not right. learning the history right. and you got started you know it's just not just behind the music and a lot of what are behind the music a lot of times they're interviewing the person and they're hitting on things but it was nothing like unsung you know unsung would go back and talk to everybody right. <laughs> even if if the person is way gone and dead, and because a Correct. lot of our artists, a lot of our pioneers have died. I think Unsung was really the first time you got to peel back the layers of the people and the music that you loved. You know, and obviously out of that, we sprung into Unsung Hollywood, which was on for a few seasons, which was comedians, actors, you know, movies, um, franchises like that. You know, I did Flip Wilson. Um, I did. I'm, I'm actually, you know, not to brag, but you know, I'm, I'm happy. I'm celebrating 2021. Is all about celebrating. I want all them roses, flowers. Give it to me. Give it to me. You know, you never know. You know, I, I don't think Kobe got on that that helicopter and thought that was the end, right? So, no, I am the only person to produce an unsung and an unsung Hollywood. And take a guess at the only artist to have an unsung and an unsung Hollywood. Brian got him behind you right now. Uh, he ain't gonna let nobody put nothing on him about him without him, you know, okay. Right, right. Well, I can't do that. No, I did Ice T. Ice T is the only person Ice to have because he has enough of a music career and enough of an acting career to marry right. enough. Maybe LL Cool J could do it. You know, you mentioned Ice T earlier, and I was about to say shout out to Ice T. Shout out to my big bro. I was trying to find my Ice T shirt that he signed for me. Shout out to my loved one, my big bro. I love you, my OG. Yo, IG, Ice, oh, T. Ice is a real player. You know what I mean? Like you know what I'm saying? He's a real player, real dude. 
and still has fun. I The first time I met Ice-T was in New York. My cousin, Breeze, uh, Michelle Johnson, that works with BT and does some things, uh, she was doing something for Khalees at the Crowbar. Khalees had an album release party, and Ice-T okay. and Coke. And the coolest person in the world. But I just saw him on The Mass. My daughter watches the show, The Mass Dancer. Yeah, <laughs> and he was on The Mass Dancer? I got to watch that. Yo, Ice-T was on The Mass Dancer, yo. I got to watch that. Send me that link. <laughs> yo, I'll, I'll send it to you. It, it messed me. I was watching it on Tubi. He was dancing? Up. Like, they were guessing who this guy was. And he takes his mask off. And everybody was like, Ice T. <laughs> but, but Ice was dancing? Dude. And he was like, why'd you do this? He was like, yo, I need something for my daughter to watch. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, My daughter likes the mask singer. I thought it would be nice for her to see me up here. And like you said, 20 years. With Law and Order. Bro. That's how, you know, I, always, I said earlier, you know, that my man Ice gave me that, 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 that sprinkle, you know, my boy Ice Cube too as well. It's a marathon, not a sprint. If I could tell you anything about our whole conversation today, if you take anything from talking to me or my life or whatever it is, um, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Meaning most people think about the hundred yards that they got to go and they're like, I'm going to just win. And most celebrities or music stars or actors, they flash out. If you think about most people who came and gone, it's about that marathon, that 1,500 meters. You know what I mean? That big, long one. And that's, that's the endurance. And so for me to be able to still be going 25 years later is a testament to that little kid. You know what I mean? And, and knowing that it was a, it was a, a marathon. Some of your, um, I, I would say the top one, but I'm going to say your top three. Your top three. I know it's hard. Your top three unsungs. Oh, wow. That's a really good question. Um, man, you're trying to kill me today. Uh, you know, I produced Bone Thugs, Houdini, Big Daddy Kane, Too Short, E-40, Arrested Development, Full Force, um, Ice-T. Uh, I could just keep going. I'm trying to think about them all. I can't even think about them all. Um, that's a good one. Zap featuring, you know, Zap and well, Roger. I should, say, I should say the one that messed you up the most. Because some of these unsungs. The one that messed you up the most, you did okay, it. Okay, I'm gonna give you top three for different reasons, real quick. Um, the number one song. Well, let's say this: the one that I like doing the most, that gave me the most pride, was Too Short, because obviously I'm from Oakland. I grew up in Oakland. I saw Todd on the bus in '85, '84, something like that as a kid. So to be able to come back to do the Legend of My City, and who was a friend of mine who I'd known for years, the pride in that was amazing. Um, second. The one that I thought, there's two, two that I thought that people needed to see, didn't know. The first one was Full Force. Full Force is one of the dopest groups in the history of music. Writers, producers, Britney Spears, Backstreet Boys, James Brown, um, UTFO. These guys are geniuses. And so nobody really knew that. And for a while, Full Force became the most highly rated unsung. And then the one after that that was really high rated was Big Daddy Kane. I was a really big fan of Big Daddy Kane. And so... To be able to see Kane and hang out with Kane was just a super dude. But my number one unsung of all time um, is 20 some episodes later, by the way, is uh, my number one unsung is is, is got to be Zap and Roger. Uh, you know, Roger Trotman, More Bounds, Computer Love, I Want to Be Your Man. Uh, the man, California Love, yeah. was one of my favorite artists. And I'm not sure if you know, but Roger, uh, Roger was killed by his brother and his brother killed him. And so... Yeah. Uh, and the brother killed himself. It was a very tragic, horrible situation. And so, you know, it took me a while to convince the Trotmans to even do it because, you know, you bury your brother and your older brother. And for their mom, she buried two sons in one day. So uh, I ended up going to Ohio, interviewing them, hanging out. And, you know, often black people don't get therapy. And so a lot of them hadn't really dealt with the trauma of what had happened, you know, and a lot of them cried in the interview. I went back to my hotel room after some of them, and I don't mind that they dumped their pain on me. They needed to get it out. And so there was a really tough, tough show. And when I went back to my room, I cried a few times because, you know, I couldn't imagine what they went through. And their whole life was, you know, Roger was the genius. Roger was Prince. Roger was R. Kelly. Roger is Stevie Wonder. He could put him with a piece of tape, and Roger could go in the studio and make a whole album, literally, with all the instruments and everything. And so um, after that show... Um, shout out to my man Lester and um, Lil Larry and my boy Zap, uh, Terry Trotman. Zap came back together. They started doing shows. That show helped put them back on the map. 
And so that's my top rated unsung of all time is not just because of what the story was, but because it what it did in direct action. I, I would have to say, you, um, yeah, I, I couldn't. I, I put you to the test because you're the producer. There's mm-hmm. no way I could rate which one, but the Zap one, yeah. Somebody like Roger Troutman in our life, like different different decades had different things they remember from Roger, but no one could have known, no one would have known his genius if it wasn't for Unsung, because mm-hmm. what he started doing and how he created um, the vocoder and how he created the instruments and was creating things he used. Um, let me tell you one that was probably one of the most impressive to me as well, that his his music was so keyed on our growing up in the 80s okay. that we didn't even function knowing how powerful it was. And he's almost parallel to, to Roger Troutman okay. on a lower level. Kashif. Oh, Kashif. Oh, okay. The Kashif unsung. Um, Totally. I didn't know about BT Express. I didn't know he was on that. You know, it, it was just it was pretty it was pretty amazing. It's those type of things that that when I looked at them. Sung, and, and mind you, I'm going through this and I'm not piecing it all together. I'm like, I got to interview Pete Frank and I'm not piecing it all together. I'm like, wait, Pete, <laughs> <laughs> you got a I, hand in this? No, but I do think Chief obviously is a genius. And uh, obviously he's one of those people like Roger who produced and did all these other things that you don't know about. Right. You know, Roger did Shirley Troutman, you know, uh, Shirley, um, you know, uh, Shirley uh, Murdoch and a lot of other things. He did California Love, a lot of great things. So, um, you know, man, it, it's good. And, and obviously now today, you know, what we're talking about mainly is this Monday, uh, Monday, January uh, holiday, uh, Martin King holiday. We have a two yes. hour uh, unsung project called Music and the Movement. It is a two hour documentary talking about how black music has always been a part of social justice. Yes. And so. You know, that airs Monday and it was great to produce that. And, you know, ice T's in there, Al Sharpton, Ice-T talking about cop killer, Al Sharpton talking about, you know, civil rights movements. I got my man Raheem Devon um, in there. I got my man DJ Yella from NWA talking about F the police. And so this is the first time that Unsung has spun off into uh, more of a franchise, like a, a documentary. You know what I mean? This Every time, usually, it's just one artist in each episode. So this is the first time, music in the movement, MLK Day, um, unsung, and is talking about black music and social justice. And this will this be on TV One or all aspects? So Monday, or- TV One, yeah, Monday on TV One. Uh, this Monday, it should be really dope. I'm excited about it. You know, this is like I say, it was really good to. I think a lot of people don't know um, enough about you know like Curtis Mayfield and yes. you know what I mean Motown and Marvin Gaye and Aretha Franklin and you know Billie Holiday and the slave songs and so much gospel and jazz. I don't think we realize how deep our roots are. And so one of the good things about this music in the movement show is that it also incorporates what's happening now. Black right. Lives Matter, Her, the baby. All these people, these kids making these social justice songs are all just capitalizing and living off of and the next generation of what, you know, Sly and his Family Stone, Chuck D, whoever it is, Ice Cube, you know what I mean? They are the new generation of that. Yeah, it's phenomenal. It's phenomenal to be a. It's it's the best of times, the worst of times, as they would say. As a writer, you know, the best of times, the worst of times. To be able to be in a in a time where the culture is moving. I heard um, and I know we gotta we gotta get out here because you got some produ- yeah, production, about, uh, production and family stuff to do. Man, but I'm gonna say this. I told y'all uh, I'm, I'm I'm daddy daycare man. Look, Corona, I need y'all to get these kids back in the school, man. Whoever's in charge of this, please. I don't understand. <laughs> What's you got going kids on? right behind the camera? Help me out, please, please. <laughs> <laughs> Look, Jesse Jackson, I was at his 75th uh, birthday event, and he said something so powerful, talking about um, Barry Gordy. And something, when Dr. King was was putting things together, I don't know if this is in a documentary or not, but I heard him when he said it out of his mouth, and I never really put it together. He said, when we were taking care of things for the movement and Dr. King couldn't make payroll, he said, well, it's a brother in Detroit that owns a record label that he'll, take, he'll, he'll give money so you can take care of the payroll. And he goes right. and it's Barry Gordy. And not only that, but he said, y'all have to realize that Motown was the music of the movement at that time. You can't see something about Vietnam or some hoses and not hear the pet, tick, pet, boom, boom, tap, boom, boom, tap, boom, boom. You know, yes, you sir. hear that, you gotta, you gotta run, brother. We got to, pet, tick, tap, boom, boom. As soon as you hear the drum. amazing about the music in the movement show, you know, one of the points that I make, I actually, this is weird to produce something, but actually be in it as well. 
um, is that one of the points that I make in the show is about Aretha Franklin. And, you know, mm -hmm. respect. My little daughter, she's six years old. She loves the song. She's respect, respect. And so what I say in the piece is that that was the theme song of African-American women. You know, it was you thought it was just respect, but it was really about the movement. It was about giving us black people respect. And so I want to make people know that Aretha Franklin was, as you said, she gave a lot of money to Martha King, a lot of money to civil rights. She was making a lot of bank and she was a very conscious art, artist. And so a lot of your great artists gave to those movements. And, you know, obviously Barry Gordy being a great one, Smokey Robinson, Harry Belafonte, all these different great guys. Well, I'm not going to hold you too long. The most unsung producer I've ever met. <laughs> it happens to put a stamp on I, I had to rock. I had to find the shirt. You know, this is one of the OG shirts right here. That is slick. Now I got to find and one. And I'm happy. Give me, give me your information. I, I, I send you a good little care package. I got a bunch of unsung swag. I told them they should put it on the website. They could get money. You know, we got to, you know, 2021, you got to hustle, TV one. I love y'all. Y'all better start selling them unsung shirts. I, <laughs> Be I, like the flea market on one Y'all never said that. So y'all <laughs> see me in the joint. Well, me and, and y'all got to talk. We all got to talk in a minute. We're going to have a conversation. But yeah, this Monday, uh, only on TV One, music in the movement, uh, starting a lot of really great and amazing people. And so, blessed to produce it. Thank you, brother. P. Frank Williams, thank you for taking time out with me, brother. I appreciate it. Oak Town to town. Four bounds. Hey, you can check everything. I'm at P. Frank Williams on all social sites, P. F. R. A. N. K. Williams. You can check me, P. Frank Williams.com. You know, I'm broadcasting live from L.A., New York, Atlanta, Oakland, wherever you find me. Most definitely. Love you, bro. Appreciate you. Hey, man. Stay up.